Hello and good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending where you are. I see everywhere from North Carolina to California. I know we've got someone from Germany here as well. Uh, so welcome to CDP Presents, our monthly webinar series. We are happy to have you all with us today. And if you've joined us before, welcome back. I am Jenna Ermold, Assistant Director of Online Training Technology and Telehealth. Uh, and part of this CDP Presents team, really happy to be here today. This project is sponsored by the Uniform Services University. However, the information or content and conclusions do not necessarily represent the official position or policy of, nor should any official endorsement be inferred on the part of USU, the Department of Defense, or the US government. Another Germany, India, holy cow, this is amazing, exciting, Africa, and then San Antonio, Texas. So this is fantastic. What a wonderful international crowd. We're so excited that people are joining from across the country and around the world. That's really exciting to see. Thanks for shouting out where you're from, everybody. Uh, as always, we like to start with a good snapshot of some upcoming trainings that we're offering in the next couple of months, and these can all be found under the upcoming training uh, tab on CDP's website, and I'm just going to highlight a couple. Um, next month for our CDP Presents, we'll be having an, an amazing panel that is going to debunk common misperceptions about sleep interventions, so we hope you can join us on October 12th. Uh, understanding and treating chronic pain in military personnel is coming up in November, and our CDP presents in November will be psychological flexibility training to enhance resilience in service members. So um, just underscoring a few of those, check out in Australia too. Wow. Um, if you want to check out the, I, I'm so distracted by this exciting stuff in the chat. If you'd like to check out our upcoming trainings, you can see additional things that uh, are coming up as well. Did you miss last month? Well, actually, to be honest, we took August off. CDP Presents was on vacation. So July, if you missed July's CDPP, never fear, we have you covered. Uh, please go to our recordings on our archived webpage. Uh, sorry, go find the recording on the archived webinars page. I will uh, say that we are in the process of, we had a little issue with the, uh, we were, keeping them on Vimeo and then we had to shift them to Panopto and we were having some, we're having some technical challenges uh, having uh, folks access that who are not a part of USU were working on it. Our short term fix is we've put it on YouTube for now on our YouTube channel. So um, last month's is there, you'll be able to access July's. Uh, however, some of the previous ones we're, we're gonna be working on figuring out a solution. So this specific one you can get to, uh, but we apologize for any inconvenience if you're struggling to get to another one. Um, feel free to always reach out if, if you're dying to watch a webinar and we can see about a workaround. But um, for now, here's here's at least July's. It was a really it was a really great one. Uh, I also wanted to give a shout out again about CDP's podcast, Practical for Your Practice. Uh, this is our bi-weekly podcast that features stories, ideas, support, and actionable intel to empower providers to keep working toward implementing EBPs with fidelity and effectiveness. As many of you know, we wrapped up season one and we are well on the way in, in season two. So just a few offerings that we're noting, making space for change, or sorry, making space for your imposter syndrome. Uh, also, but my client is pregnant, how and why you can treat PTSD during pregnancy. We get a lot of questions about that in our consultation group. So we actually interviewed an expert on that. So you want to be a military psychologist. Uh, you, can, you can listen as we sit down with a couple of uh, Air Force psychologists to talk about what that process looks like, if that's of interest to you as well. So please don't forget to subscribe on your favorite platform, and we hope you check that out. As always, I will do before I introduce our speaker, I'll take a few minutes to orient to some of those features in Zoom. If you entered the webinar in full screen, go ahead and hit the escape, click on your screen, hit escape, that'll, that'll help with functionality. For the best user experience, we do uh, recommend you, you wear one of these stylish headphones. It, help, it really does help the audio. Um, we recommend you close all programs in the background on your computer. Any difficulty viewing is, is likely due to a poor connection. 
Uh, please note the chat feature, which of course many of you have already found at the bottom of the screen there. Just a reminder, it is defaulted to host and panelists. That means it's just us that hears the awesome things you have to say and the questions that you're asking. We'd love the group to be able to do that. So if everybody can make sure that their blue drop down bar is selected uh, to every everyone is selected, that will allow everyone to see your great observations and questions. I will be moderating questions in the last 10 minutes of our presentation today um, and collecting those for Dr. May. If you have any te technical difficulty, go ahead and uh, you can type that problem in the chat and one of our awesome tech support team folks will reach out to assist you. And uh, as always, the webinar is going to be recorded and we will be posting it on our website once we figure out our solution. Um, and handouts for today can be found in your CE21 My account page under this event, as always. At the end of the webinar, Mr. Micah Norgard is going to provide that information about how to obtain your CEs. A reminder to obtain that CE credit, you must attend the entire webinar and complete the survey in CE21. Uh, we are continuing to offer American Psychological Association CE credits, which are acceptable to most state licensing boards for different mental health disciplines. But as always, please uh, check the requirements for your state and retain any documentation you might need. And now, without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexis May, who is an assistant professor of psychology at Wesleyan University and an adjunct assistant professor of research at the University of Utah. Her research uses observational, experimental, and meta-analytic meta methods to understand the etiology and trajectory of suicidal thoughts and behaviors in the service of improving prevention and intervention. Her lab currently focuses on developing brief suicide prevention interventions for dyads. Her research is funded by the Military Suicide Research Consortium, a program of the Department of Defense. Dr. May received her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of British Columbia, completed a psychology internship at the Alpert Medical School of Brown University, and a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Center for Veteran Studies at the University of Utah. Clinically, she is trained in dialectical behavior therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and motivational interviewing. And again, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. May, especially um, as we acknowledge Suicide Prevention Month, September being the month that we really try to highlight this important issue that we need to focus on, obviously, year round. Uh, but Dr. May, I will turn the, the mic over to you and look forward to today's presentation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ermholt, for that introduction. Um, thank you so much. And I'm just going to double check. Folks are hearing me okay? Unless I hear otherwise, I will, I will you assume we go. Great. <laughs> Thanks, all. It's always a little uh, step into the, into the beyond when you start talking to the computer. Um, I am so grateful to be here, and I'm so... Um, grateful and glad to have so many of you here from, um, as I was hearing all over um, this great earth that we are on. Um, and thank you so much to the Center for Deployment Psychology for hosting this webinar, for having me. Um, this is an incredible series of talks that are put together, um, and I'm very excited to be included among them. Um, I especially want to thank Dr. Um, Aaron Frick for uh, originally um, extending the invitation and getting me connected here. and. Um, for Dr. Umhold for uh, that wonderful introduction and also uh, just making this a very smooth process. Um, so thank you all. As uh, you heard already, my name is Alexis May. Uh, I am an assistant professor of psychology at Wesleyan University, which is located in the small state of Connecticut, which is in the New England area of the United States. Um, I am also an adjunct assistant professor of research at the University of Utah, so over in the Mountain West. Um, and I'm also a licensed clinical psychologist. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn my video off because I know that can help some folks in terms of bandwidth. Um, so I will pop it back on um, at points, but uh, for now, I will turn it off so we can focus on my voice and the slides. All right. So some of the work I'm going to discuss um, is supported by the Military Suicide Research Consortium via the Department of Defense. And so I just want to reiterate from my perspective also that everything I have to say is my own and is not necessarily endorsed by the MSRC or the DOD. <clears throat> so what is our plan for the next hour and a half? 
Um, today, I'm going to be talking about the role of significant others in suicide prevention. And I'm going to start out by reviewing the impact of suicide in the United States, um, trying to get us kind of all on the same page. Um, as was mentioned, uh, September is Suicide Prevention Month, so it, you may be seeing some of this kind of in your um, feeds in the media, but I just want to make sure we're kind of all on the same page. I'm going to also highlight some interventions that have found, been found to be effective for suicide prevention, but then also focus on um, really discussing a gaping hole that we have in suicide prevention, or at least that I perceive as a whole, um, which is dyadic interventions for suicide prevention. And um, spend some time really uncovering what some of the reasons may be that we uh, have an absence of um, work in that area. Um, and then finally, I'll be describing some work that is starting to fill that hole, some three brand new dyadic suicide prevention interventions that are really in the initial stages of development and testing. And I do want to emphasize that from the get-go, from the start, that these new interventions I'll be talking about are all in the development and pilot testing phase. We just aren't at the stage yet as a field um, where we have strong evidence-based um, dyadic suicide prevention interventions. But what I really hope um, is that by learning what is coming down the pike, you'll will help you not only just kind of be aware of maybe what to look out for as, as this work um, grows and continues, but also that even right now today, it will help you think through how you either are involving or perhaps aren't involving um, allies or partners um, in your patient suicide prevention journeys, or perhaps how you're looking at these things or, or not in your own research. Um, and I'll do my best to leave at least 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions, comments, discussion, and would love to um, hear your thoughts and perspectives um, on all of this work. <clears throat> um, now, I'm, I'm hoping no one is surprised given the title of this talk, but we are going to be talking a lot about suicide today. Um, suicidal thoughts, behaviors, and deaths are heart-wrenching, right? And they are a common experience for our clients and, and sometimes for us as providers. And so I imagine these resources are probably very familiar to you. And I apologize for our international folks. These are very um, U.S.-centric resources. Um, but I wanted to uh, make sure that they were top of mind for everybody. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't make sure that, that we, we all had these available to us and to share with our clients. Um, so the Suicide Prevention Lifeline um, is now able to be reached by calling 988, the Veterans Crisis Line, um, the same, calling 988 and pressing 1. Um, and then also, as you may experience, a lot of individuals pre prefer to communicate via text these days. And so the Crisis Text Line is very, um, one option for, for folks who want to seek out help in that, um, in that way. So in the United States, suicide rates have been steadily on the rise since about um, 2000, around the turn of the century. Um, we had small declines totaling about 5% in the last two years between 2018 and 2020. And if the narrative in the US is that there's an epidemic of suicides. Um, and of course, that's been very true across, across the last 20 years. We've had this incredibly concerning increase. And hopefully you can see on the slide here where, um, just to orient you to it, um, on the x-axis, we have time moving from 1907 to 2017. On the y-axis, we have um, age-adjusted U.S. suicide death rates um, per 100,000 people. Um, and so what we're really looking at here is um, the trajectory of suicide death rates in the U.S. over time. And I like to show this graph because I think it is important to consider this last kind of 20-ish year um, kind of skyrocketing of suicide death rates in the context of um, a much larger swath of history. And so we can see that suicide actually peaked um, as best our, you know, our data can capture it during the era of the Great Depression and then dropped again during World War II. Um, in the more recent past, we can see a pretty steady drop from the late 80s through the late 90s, and then a steady rise since the turn of the century. So our best estimates suggest that current rates are actually much lower than they were in the 1900s to 1940s, which I think is sometimes a, a surprise to folks when the um, kind of got most of their information from 
from kind of more recent media where, again, thankfully, we've had a focus on the problem that's been occurring, but we've kind of lacked this historical context. Um, and rates are much higher than they were in the 40s through 90s. This, um, our most recent rise in suicide rates as a country has primarily been driven in by an increase of suicide deaths among women, um, though rates for both men and women have risen just at a greater speed for women. Um, and recently, the rate has also been rising particularly quickly among adolescents and young adults. So though that age group still accounts for a small proportion of the total number of suicides per year, um, the Kind of change in in rate is uh, is quite concerning. Now, in the field of suicidology, there is of course a lot of interest in the reasons behind this underlying change in rates. Um, however, we really just don't have very much definitive data. There are hypotheses around um, increases in technology use, changes in technology use, increases in social media, um, growing income disparities, greater access to lethal means. Um, However, none of those hypotheses are strongly supported yet by data. Um, and we also do have this very new and perhaps hopefully promising change that I mentioned that in the last two years of reporting, um, including the first year of the pandemic, suicide rates have gone down about 5% um, in the United States. Um, now, whether this change will be uh, sustained, we don't know. And also important um, to note that that change is primarily driven by a decline in suicide deaths among white Americans, but um, hasn't been consistently observed across racial or ethnic groups. So a lot of, of um, complexity to consider there when we look at this um, somewhat simple graph. I think it can be kind of hard to make sense of these abstract large numbers. Um, so I also like to show them in some context. Um, here we have the number of deaths in 2018 in the US from homicides in bed and from car accidents in orange. Um, and when we add the bar for suicide deaths in that same year, we see that suicide, suicide causes almost three times the number of deaths as homicides and many more deaths than car accidents uh, each year. And I think this is really telling when we think about the amount of news coverage, for example, that we see um, regarding homicide death and violent crime, the amount of thought and regulation and actual kind of mechanical engineering that goes into preventing motor vehicle death. Um, and while the discussion of, of suicide has increased in the last decade, I think we're um, seeing it much more commonly in uh, in research and public health campaigns and uh, awareness about the suicide lifeline. Um, the uh, introduction of 988, we still have a, a really long way to go in terms of um, trying to match the, the resources and the, um, uh, the kind of innovative strategies that, have, that are taken um, towards some of these other causes. Of it. So, so far we've been focusing on suicide deaths. Um, beyond these tragic deaths, there's a uh, huge amount of suicidality, suicidal thoughts and behaviors that are experienced and um, really reflect great pain and suffering uh, among American adults um, and Americans in general. Um, so this particular graph, uh, sorry, infographic is showing data from the uh, SAMHSA, one of SAMHSA's um, nationally representative surveys. And so they found in 2019 an estimated one and a half million American adults attempted suicide, a further 11 and a half million considered suicide but didn't act on their thoughts. So there are many, many, many individuals there struggling, working really hard to stay here with us. <clears throat> that previous slide focused on um, the population at large, our previous slides um, about suicide deaths, but what if we look at military communi communities? Um, here we're looking at individuals um, in active duty, those in reserve, and those in the National Guard. And what we see is that there are similar rates of suicide death to the US national population once we account for age and sex. Um, so tragically, that means that um, 580 suicide uh, service members died by suicide in 2020, in the last year of I had available data. What about if we look among veterans? In 2019, 6,261 veterans died by suicide. This accounts for almost 14% of all US suicide deaths that year. Um, if we look for veterans at age and sex adjusted comparisons, um, we see that veterans have 
and continue have had and continue to have um, higher rates of suicide death compared to non-veteran U.S. adults. Um, and the rates have been consistent in that they follow national trends. We have seen a small decline from 2018 to 2019. Um, but these are groups that are uh, at particular risk. I want to turn now to from the impact of suicide from really kind of sitting with the um, the impact that it has on our country and on our clients to thinking about some of the interventions that we do have available um, and that we do have that uh, efficacy and evidence for. Throughout these past three decades, our understanding of how suicidal thoughts and behaviors work has really grown. And this has happened hand in hand with the development and testing of a lot of suicide specific interventions for adults, which really didn't exist you know, 20, 20 years, 25 years ago. Um, and by suicide specific interventions, I mean those that place suicidal thoughts and behaviors as the primary treatment target. So in contrast to other interventions that focus on a diagnosis and assume that suicidality will remit when symptoms do, suicide focused interventions um, kind of put the suicidal thoughts or behaviors front and center. So these and suicide specific interventions range in their focus and their duration. Um, there are single session interventions like crisis response planning or the safety planning intervention. There are brief interventions um, like the attempted suicide short intervention program, ACIP. <clears throat> there are adjunctive transdiagnostic frameworks available like the collaborative assessment and management of suicidality or CAN. We have multi-session treatment packages, things like the brief cognitive behavioral therapy or cognitive therapy for suicide prevention. And we also have longer term multimodal treatment packages like dialectical behavior therapy. Now these interventions I've just um, outlined are very different in their focus, in their structure, in their intended patient population, in their proposed mechanisms of action. Um, however, they are united in um, at least one thing, which is that they focus solely on the suicidal individual. Um, so even some of these interventions that have been turned into group versions or group versions of these interventions, um, those group groups still focus on a number of suicide individuals altogether. Um, and none of them, um, at least intentionally, include um, support network as part of the uh, manualized treatment itself. And this focus on the individual is somewhat in contrast to both theory and data that really emphasize the role of interpersonal connection in suicide. Um, so understanding and understanding that suicide is directly tied to interpersonal relationships comes from our earliest work in the field, all the way back to the socio sociological work by Emile Durkheim, right? Over these past 20 years, even our most modern theories of suicidal processes processes that have emerged have all continued to highlight the impact of interpersonal connection. So these include theories that I've, I've put up on the slide here, the interpersonal psychological theory of suicide, um, that's Thomas Joyner's theory, the integrated motivational volitional model um, from Rory O'Connor, the three-step theory um, from myself and David Plansky. These theories differ in their framing of connection for sure, but they all identify the protective nature of interpersonal relationships, emotional connection, social support, and or the problematic nature of disrupted connect connection. So feeling like a burden or feeling a lack of belongingness. So just to highlight that um, in two of these theories, Thomas Joyner's interpersonal psychological theory emphasizes the role of two specific threats to interpersonal connection, thwarted belongingness, that feeling, um, I don't fit in, I'm alone, and also the perception of burdensomeness. I feel like I'm a burden to others, my death is worth more than my life, I'm dragging others down. And this theory posits that only individuals who experience both of these types of interpersonal disruption will go on to develop serious suicide ideation. Now, the 3ST, the three step theory, on the other hand, is a, another theory that posits that suicide ideation intensifies when connectedness writ large is overwhelmed by pain. So the most common source of connection um, that we as, as humans uh, tend to identify is interpersonal connection, interpersonal relationships, though the 3ST holds that that connection can come from diverse sources, 
This could be connection to pets or sports teams, to a role or a responsibility, to a higher power. Um, so the three ST posits that these types of connections serve as a tether to life when pain and hopelessness rise. So as, as laid out there in step two, if pain or psych ache is greater, overwhelms that feeling of connectedness, then ideation is likely to worsen and become active. And there are multiple studies supporting this contention and finding that when connection is overwhelmed or eroded by pain, suicidal desire grows. Beyond these assertions by specific theories, we also have a wealth of empirical data supporting the relationship between suicide ideation, attempts, and death, and really diverse definitions of disrupted connection, um, including things like isolation, so being physically separated from others, um, the experience of loneliness, feeling alone even if you're surrounded by others, romantic conflict, familial conflict. Um, there's so much data here. I think the most helpful thing to do is point you in the direction of two recent reviews. If you'd like to kind of go on a deep dive, um, McClellan looked at loneliness and suicide ideation and suicide attempt, while Kaladi et al. examined uh, social isolation. So combined, we have you know, a number of modern theories of suicide and an overwhelming amount of data that are suggesting that increasing interpersonal connection could decrease the intensity of suicidal desire. And if we could achieve that, right, if we could reduce suicidal desire or suicide ideation, then that would subsequently reduce the need for suicidal behavior, reducing suicide attempts and death. So this sounds like a pretty good target, right? It sounds pretty like you might have come here and said, yeah, like, makes sense to me. I you know, see that every single day in my practice that, that these relationships are really key. And, and we know just from our lives that interpersonal connections are um, critical. So it seems like this would be a great target. So given that it kind of makes sense on its surface, why don't we have a plethora of interventions focused on interpersonal relationships? Um, I think that's in part because relationships, particularly romantic relationships, are so powerful and complex. They can function both as this amazing source of social support and meaning, and also as an acute and incredibly um, personal source of pain. So for example, we know that <clears throat> mortality and health outcomes, um, both physical and mental health, tend to be better among married individuals compared to unmarried individuals. But then when we look beyond kind of selection of facts, most research finds that marital status alone isn't robustly protected. The benefits are observed when we look at marital quality. Um, and in fact, separation from one's spouse is a strong indicator of suicide risk, finding that um, aligns with this research supporting relationship discord being a big risk factor for suicide. If we look to studies um, based in the military, we find um, a study of soldiers that found that relationship problems were the most frequently endorsed stressors during the 24 hours immediately preceding a suicide attempt. Uh, additionally, suicidal individuals who have persistent relationship problems are also more likely to have made uh, multiple suicide attempts and to experience longer episodes of um, suicidality. So, of course, we know that suicidal behavior is not caused by any single event, but rather by a constellation of excuse me, a constellation of factors. <clears throat> However, relationship breakdowns are consistently identified as a proximal risk factor for suicidal thoughts and behaviors for many people. They come up over and over again. So these interpersonal relationships are really a high value target. When the going is good, they appear to provide a lot of support and protection. When they break down, they can be a catalyst for crisis. So clearly then how to involve significant others in prevention is probably not as simple as just bringing the person into the room and just doing the same thing you would do with the individual, just bring out their partner on in. There's a lot of things we wanna um, consider before we uh, just kind of make the leap. Um, and one place we can start is by learning from other health conditions that have really trailblazed the inclusion of um, family members in treatment. So the support and involvement of a friend or family member has been found in a lot of empirical work to improve a wide array of health and behavioral outcomes. 
um, so that we don't have this in su the field of suicidology so far, we can we can look to our neighboring fields. There's compelling data for this um, for outcomes like diabetes management, smoking sensation, problem gambling, substance use, um, alcohol problems, um, and psychosis. Um, I think psychosis is a particularly noteworthy um, example. Um, across about 50 randomized controlled trials, family-involved interventions for psychosis have yielded better outcomes, meaning um, improved symptoms, fewer relapses, reduced hospitalization um, than patient-only uh, outcomes. I'm sorry, patient-only intervention. <clears throat> and since this literature has accumulated, these recommendations have been codified in treatment guidelines offered by organizations like the National Institute for Care and Excellence, and the International Early Psychosis Association. So in light of these findings, healthcare that includes an ally in treatment has really become the gold standard for psychosis treatment. Um, and the specific recommendations include things like considering maintaining contact with family members, even if the patient is not engaging regularly in treatment. Could be things like including family members in the assessment and treatment planning process. Um, taking into account what a family can manage when considering how to handle a crisis, um, assessing and treating family stress as a potential contributor to um, flaring or worsening psychotic symptoms, providing emotional support and education to family members, especially when they access care, um, at that first point when they access care, because that's been observed that that's usually a crisis point and a point where um, there's a lot of opportunity to engage and support the family. Um, also for more, prom more complex or prolonged cases, continuing to offer support or ideas to the family, proactively providing additional resources, and that noting that sometimes family therapy may be indicated, and across the board, understanding that families need to be empowered in their role um, as, as supports. Um, so why don't we see suicide interventions through that same lens, right? Why don't we have partner or family involved interventions available for suicide? We actually kind of interestingly do already have recommendations from our professional bodies. So the best practices recommendations from the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention, in fact, explicitly recommend involving fr friends and family in crisis response or safety planning and also in outpatient care. Um, and I would imagine that many of you are also doing this in various ways in your practices, right? This is, you know, we're out practicing seeing clients, it um, comes up all the time. However, we don't have any evidence-based partner or family involved suicide prevention interventions to, um, to, to base that work on. And I think that's in part because we have some unique challenges in this space. And so I'm going to spend a bit of time now teasing apart those challenges and, you know, I'm curious to hear whether these challengers or others are, are some of the ones that come up for you. All right. So one of the um, challenges that we have when we're thinking about suicidal individuals and involving their partners. And I, I just want to note here too, I go back and forth a little bit between talking about partners, family members, allies, um, significant others. Uh, and some of the research you'll see we're focusing specifically on romantic relationships, but a lot of times we're, we're starting to think a little more broadly about that as well and, and using those words interchangeably. So suicidal individuals, even when they report that they want to disclose their suicidality, report problems with stigma and negative response from, from their allies or friends or family. There's some really wonderful work by Laura Frey and colleagues that have found that suicide individuals, suicidal individuals cite shame and fear about negative reactions from those close to them as key factors that prevent them from engaging their social networks. And further, she found that suicidal individuals who did disclose their suicidality to close confidants reported experiencing often either overreactions, underreactions, or stigma. But I think it's important to note both of those um, potential challenging reactions. They they were um, struggling with underreactions, where, for example, for example, the confidant only focused on the impact to the family, where the person maybe. Um, assumed the suicidality would never happen again, where they said, you know, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you'll be okay, you can get over this. 
And they also were faced with overreactions. So friends or family members who then engaged in kind of monitoring every behavior, in um, calling 911 or forcing them to go to the hospital. Um, and both of those types of reactions were of concern to suicidal individuals. And of course, these experiences can then reduce the willingness to disclose again in the future, which um, is a dangerous situation to be in when another suicidal crisis is quite possibly quite possible to arrive. Um, I want to dive into it just a little bit of data on this um, that I've collected. This was a study I conducted um, with National Guard couples. <clears throat> and I found that while, um, and what, what we did basically was to have couples um, come into the to lab and they, um, each member of the couple reported on two things. One was their own history of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And then they did a separate interview where they were reporting on their um, perceptions or understanding of their partner's history of suicidal thoughts and behavior. And what we then did was compare these two things to see how accurate each partner was in their knowledge of their spouse's um, history of suicidality, taking their spouse's uh, self-report as truth. Um, and what we found out was that while most partners were aware of their loved ones, um, suicide ide history of suicide ideation. So about 85% of people um, correctly identified that. Um, was many fewer were aware of suicidal behavior. Um, and it's not pictured here, but this same uh, lack of information was true for another item that we asked about, which is particularly important, um, which is concerns about future suicide risk. So we asked people the likelihood they thought they would think about suicide or have a suicide attempt in the future. And um, partners were really not lined up with the degree to which they were um, concerned for themselves or concerned uh, for their partner. So um, what this suggests to me is that suicidal individuals might only share some information when they disclose. So it's not a, necessarily an entirely closed door but perhaps fearing the reaction of sharing a more stigmatized experience, like actually acting on suicidal thoughts, um, might, might be a, a step too far for them. So perhaps disclosing within the scaffolding of a dyadic intervention and with the support of a mental health care provider there, um, that may uh, improve the disclosure process um, and allow for more information to be shared. Now, another challenge that um, we have is that allies, while really often wanting to provide support, um, express mis misinformation and also a lack of confidence in what to do when they hear this information. Um, they hear that their partner or their loved one is um, thinking about suicide. And we don't have any reason to believe that the social networks of suicidal individuals are any more informed about suicide than the general public. <clears throat> um, Allies misconceptions about suicide, so things like um, perhaps the belief that asking about suicide increases risk might prevent them from directly asking about a warning sign or providing um, early intervention uh, or might foster some of those unhelpful responses to disclosure we just talked about. Uh, and allies themselves in, in studies where they're, you know, they're asked, they recognize their lack of knowledge and in fact cite that as a barrier to being able to provide support. Um, so a common theme in qualitative interviews of family members of suicidal individuals was a desire for education about suicide and also for specific pragmatic information about what they can do to help, right? Of course, it's um, an incredibly hard and scary place to be to, to have the information that someone you love is in uh, such danger and in such pain and not know what to do. Um, and we had some data from a large cross-sectional study as well that found that allies with that knowledge, so allies who expressed confidence in talking about suicide, who had information about providing support, they actually experienced less caregiver burden than um, family members who, who lacked that information. So this suggests that a successful dyadic intervention would provide allies with accurate information about suicide as well as some pragmatic strategies about how they might be effective in their relationship. All right, so we have those two challenges. A third challenge we face is that suicidal individuals worry a lot about being a burden. Um, many survivors of suicide attempts are concerned about the impact their disclosure is gonna have on their friends and family, not just about what they'll, you know, the reactions they'll get, but the impact 
um, it might have in making their friends or family members feel worried or concerned or overwhelmed. Um, and these fears might interact with existing perceptions they have of burdensomeness, which can, which can underlie the suicide ideation itself. So we get into kind of a really sticky um, uh, sort of network of thoughts here where it feel you're feeling suicidal, you feel like you're a burden to others, and it feels like if you shared that suicidal ideation with others, you would um, become even more of a burden. So a dyadic intervention that reduces that patient caregiver and its dynamic rather than reinforcing it may help alleviate some of those concerns. <clears throat> and to continue um, to reduce that fear of burdensomeness, a successful dyadic intervention would need to include skills that help both the suicidal individual and the ally effectively identify and communicate some boundaries around support and availability and privacy. Um, so I think a real critical element about reducing the perception of burden and reducing the perception of burdensomeness is to bring those concerns out in the open and to help uh, a, a dyad, a couple, um, really discuss what some of those limits that the loved one might have. When can they answer the phone? When can't they answer the phone? Um, how much time do they have you know, available in a week to spend together? Um, and when those limits or boundaries are known and respectfully communicated, and often with the support of a therapist mediating that conversation, the suicidal individual might have less of a chance of feeling and perhaps becoming the burden that they, they really fear. Now, the fourth challenge I want to highlight is that of um, burnout um, that allies of suicidal individuals report. <clears throat> So allies of suicidal individuals are themselves under a high degree of stress, of course, right? They're love, loving and possibly caring for someone who's in the midst of a life-threatening mental health crisis and potentially has been in and out of such a crisis many, many times um, uh, or for a prolonged period of time. We know that partners of individuals who are admitted for psychiatric care are they themselves at five times the risk of suicide death than those who don't, whose partners have not been admitted for psychiatric care. An added barrier is that allies often tend to feel excluded from decision-making for their loved one. So whether that's due to confidentiality concerns, um, limited time by healthcare providers, uh, whatever the, the reason, this can often lead to increased stress, feeling like they are in a role of trying to provide care or support, but they don't have enough information to do that, and they don't have an open line of communication. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, the data suggests this burden can be lessened by the helping build an ally, helping build ally confidence. So these findings, I think, suggest that a successful dyadic intervention would explicitly invite the allies to um, into the suicidal individual's recovery process, of course, with the explicit permission and invita invitation of the patient themselves, um, but really to uh, bring them in so they, they can kind of uh, see what's happening on the inside in terms of how their loved one is working to stay alive and working to manage their suicidal thoughts, working towards recovery, and also that it would engage the ally in developing some of their own strategies, perhaps, for coping with crisis or coping with emotional overwhelm. So the presence of the barriers and challenges that I just reviewed um, to me really highlight even more the need for new evidence-based interventions that purposefully are designed to integrate partners and other loved ones into the care of suicidal individuals. Because without constructing thoughtful interventions and then testing them thoroughly, we don't know, including significant others could be ineffective or even worse, it could be iatrogenic. Um, for example, if it doesn't go well, it could discourage the suicidal individual from disclosing in the future. It could worsen burden, or burden felt by allies. There are things that I think um, we always want to test our interventions, but particularly here, we want to be really aware of some potential um, negative outcomes that um, that could occur and, and really be thoughtful about how we um, design and then, then redesign and retest these interventions as we, um, as we look at them. Um, So as I mentioned at the start, um, we don't have these interventions yet, right? We don't, we're not there yet. Um, a review of the literature through 2019 found that no interventions with a family component for adults. Um, however, in contrast, they did find 12 family-involved interventions for adolescents. 
Um, for teens, treatment involving the family was generally more effective in reducing adolescent suicidal thoughts and behaviors than individual interventions. Um, again, I would say we're you know, still in the, the early days of um, building a substantial research body about teen um, interventions for teen suicidality, but the um, suggestions from that literature review or that family-involved interventions were particularly powerful. Um, and these interventions for adolescents ranged um, in the amount that they involved family. They ranged from individually focused treatments that just included some limited psychoeducation for the family members, all the way to attachment-based family therapy with a focus on suicide prevention. Um, and clearly, teens and their families are a very different population than suicidal adults and their romantic partners or their loved ones. Um, but the fact that these more family-based interventions seems to be working well for teens, I think provides some um, hope that the promise of these um, emerging dyadic suicide prevention interventions we have for, for adults um, may have good outcomes as well. So what we're going to do um, in just a few minutes is come back and talk about three of these new emerging dyadic suicide prevention interventions for adults. Um, but before we do that, I want us to take a little break. Um, the, this is a little stretch break. I want us to practice what we preach to our clients, to our students. I'm trying to do more of this myself. I'm going to turn my camera on so you can see I'm a real human here who does believe this. Um, we spend a lot of time sitting on our computers and staring at our screen. So I want us to just take three minutes. I'm going to set a timer to stretch, refill your water, look away into the distance, let your mind wander, whatever you need to do to take care of you. And then we're going to come back in three minutes and we're going to dive into learning about these three very different brand new dyadic suicide prevention interventions that are that are on the horizon. So I'm going to set a timer. I'm going to turn off my video and mute myself and I will see you in three minutes.
All right, welcome back everybody. Um, I hope that you have a chance to move your body a little bit. There's our timer. Um, if you got called into the siren song of email um, or your phone, I would encourage you to close that up, rejoin us. Um, and uh, we are gonna dive into um, some really new, exciting literature right now. All right. So in just the past two years, this is all kind of hot off the presses information. Um, we've had two new interventions that have been published. And, and I, by we, I mean the field. So these are the first two I'm gonna talk about are by folks um, that, uh, that I'm not uh, affiliated with this research. I just am very appreciative of it. Um, the third is some research that I'm doing myself that I'll talk about. Um, the third, the third piece of research I'll talk about um, is one where we've just finished data collection. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about that project and, and what we're learning from it um, and what's to come. Now, interestingly, all three of these projects I'm going to discuss were conducted with either, either veteran or military population. So this really is the um, the area and people working in this area who are who are doing the cutting edge uh, edge research on. Um, which I think is particularly uh, exciting for for us to work with with um, veterans and and folks in the military. So the first um, intervention that I'd like to describe is a couples based intervention targeting both suicidal thoughts. Oops, I'm going to stop my video just so I don't mess with everyone's bandwidth. Sorry about that. Um, this is a couples based intervention targeting both suicidal thoughts and behaviors um, and relationship functioning. So this treatment is called the treatment for relationships and safety together. Um, I believe you pronounce the acronym TRUST. I have to check with um, Thea and Chandra on that. This was developed by Chandra Khalifian at the San Diego VA. And the treatment consists of 10 90 minute sessions that are delivered conjointly um, with both members of the couple. <clears throat> and this pulls on both brief cognitive behavioral therapy for suicide, BCBT, and also cognitive behavioral couples therapy. Um, and currently this intervention has been examined in a pilot sample of five couples. So rather than focusing just on the suicidal patient, what TRUST does is emphasize the emotional and cognitive experiences of both partners, and then provides a conceptual framework that outlines and tries to illustrate it, break down for the couple, the dysfunctional couples pattern that in and of itself is exacerbating risk for suicide and for relationship distress. So trust uses this pattern as a roadmap and then um, it does you know, teaching of specific skills to interrupt that pattern and to guide the couples in discussing vulnerable thoughts and feelings related to suicide and relationship distress, um, to addressing challenging maladaptive thoughts, and then to work on problem solving together. And I think this approach is really interesting as it's really grounded in a couples therapy approach. I think it was, it was born of couples therapy with the couple as the unit of treatment but it holds suicidality front and center and is really um, keeps a focus on trying to uncover how the couple's communication pattern, how the couple's dynamics are really interwoven with the emergence of suicidality that's occurring for at least one member of the couple. Um, so far, this intervention, as I mentioned, was piloted in a sample of five couples seeking services for relationship distress through the VA Family Mental Health Program. Um, and as um, Dr. Kalifian reports in this, uh, this article here, initial results from the pilot sample showed that in, there was some improvement in communication and in relationship satisfaction, um, some reductions in feelings of burdensomeness and thwarted belongingness, and these were pre-post um, measures, um, and also small reductions in suicide ideation at the end of treatment. Um, this article also includes some qualitative results that I think are interesting. Um, as they kind of across the board, across these five couples, suggested that they all found identifying that couple's pattern that led to the suicidal pattern particularly helpful, that that was a really key. Um, now, of course, there are the inherent limitations of an initial pilot trial, trial um, namely there was no control group, um, there was an absence of independent assessors, um, and five couples is a very small sample. So this precludes us from drawing full conclusions. However, I think this is incredibly promising and a new approach to helping couples who are tangled up both in relationship problems and in suicidal thought, thoughts that are really um, feeding into each other. The, the second intervention <clears throat> I'd like to describe is 
a um, short-term therapeutic course designed to bolster significant others' ability to support their loved one's safety plan. So this is the Safe Action for Families to Encourage Recovery, or SAFER, another um, great acronym. Um, this was developed by Dr. Marianne, Marianne Goodman and her group at the Bronx VA. And this intervention is a manualized four session, 90 minute dyad based treatment package, so 90 minutes per session, um, that's really focuses on um, psychoeducation about suicide, as well as building a suicide uh, safety plan for the suicidal veteran. And then in parallel, building a plan for the family member as to how to support the veteran in executing each step of their safety plan. So kind of having a, uh, a version of the veteran's suicide safety plan for the family member so they know how to access social supports or how to encourage a particular coping skill. Um, this intervention was tested um, against a single session control condition with just the suicidal um, veteran having a single safety planning intervention. Uh, session. Uh, and the sample had uh, 39 veterans and their care partners. Um, participants had to have either three months of active suicide ideation or a lifetime suicide attempt to be included, um, but they were excluded if they had an attempt in the past three months or active psychosis or substance abuse or intimate partner violence. So they, their sample they were looking at was kind of that intermediate risk group. Um, and this trial, care partners included spouses, but also um, parents, friends. So this is one example of an intervention that um, looked at care partners more broadly, not just um, romantic partners. And the team found that the veteran suicide ideation severity decreased post-treatment and at three month follow-ups in the safer condition as compared to the control condition. Interestingly, veterans' feelings of burdensomeness, belongingness, or caregiver feelings of burden were not related to congestion, suggesting that these hypothesized mechanisms for change might not have been um, really at the core of what was making a difference. So this preliminary work reveals both the promise of a dyadic safety plan intervention, as well as some of the, the complexity and understanding you know, what elements of it um, were, were most effective or most important. Um, but I think this approach is really unique in its inclusion of care partners who hold all different types of relationships with the suicidal individual. Um, and it's focused on getting the care partner closely involved with the suicidal individual safety plan. So that idea of having them kind of join in the sessions um, explicitly. So these two interventions hold a lot of exciting promise. Um, I'm very excited to see what comes next with both of these groups. Um, when I was kind of beginning to, to do work in this field, however, there was an, uh, an absence that I noted um, that I wanted to, to work on, which was the absence of a really brief dyadic suicide prevention intervention that is particularly easily deployable in our current healthcare system. And I, I um, so something that is designed for one-off visits, that is designed to be um, more, uh, perhaps more accessible to a wider array of people or a right, wider array of settings, um, and to see if we can we can get some um, some impact there. So I'm going to use the remainder of our time um, to discuss one such dyadic intervention that I've developed and I'm currently testing. Ooh, look too fast there. Um, so. Again, just to highlight by brief intervention, what I mean is a single session intervention like crisis response planning, safety planning intervention, lethal means counseling, things I'm, I'm sure, imagine you might be familiar with. Um, these are interventions that are typically done anywhere from 20 to 50 minutes. They occur in lots of diverse settings from primary care offices to therapy rooms to emergency departments. And the individual versions of these interventions, I think, have, have shown a lot of promise. And so I think that they're um, uh, uniquely suited to for adaptation to a dyadic version. So the um, intervention that I was working with was the crisis response plan. Um, this is a 30 minute session designed by Craig Bryan and David Rudd to reduce suicide attempts by targeting several deficits that increase the risk for suicidal behavior. So targeting deficits in self-monitoring and emotion regulation and problem solving. It involves having a brief narrative assessment of the most recent crisis and then the development of a pragmatic crisis response plan um, the elements are similar to those in safety planning intervention, a little different, but they focus on identifying personal warning signs of an impending crisis, identifying self-management skills like distraction, relaxation, identifying personal reasons for living, identifying positive social support, and then finally um, getting some psychoeducation about accessing professional resources and crisis resources. 
And we have data from um, multiple trials that finds the CRP helps reduce uh, suicide attempts over the six months following um, provision of the crisis response plan. Um, and that it also um, has a faster reduction in suicide ideation. Also, when we looked at follow up, um, did some follow up analyses of some of the initial trial data, um, examining how the CRP was used by participants, what we found was that those social supports were the most commonly recalled component of the crisis response plan. So when we asked people, what did you actually do with the crisis response plan after that single session where you developed it and, and got it to take home with you? this index card, um, about three quarters of participants recalled that social supports were on their plan, but only about a third of participants reported actually contacting or calling their social support. So again, this <clears throat> finding to me suggested that while the CRP increased recall or awareness of social support resources, it wasn't necessarily going far enough to help people actually use those resources. And modifications to enhance that might help. Um, so all of the above led me, along with my collaborators, um, Craig Bryan, now of The Ohio State University, and Brian Bachman at the University of Utah to develop the Couples Crisis Response Plan. So I'm going to describe the intervention and provide the rationale for why we made the specific adaptations that we did. So the CCRP, as uh, a less fun acronym than the other groups, but as I call it, consists of a single 15-minute joint session with a couple um, conducted by a behavioral health care provider. Um, and again, I want to emphasize this was designed as a suicide prevention intervention. It was not meant to be couple therapy by any means, so diff very different from um, trust, for example. Um, the session begins with an introduction, followed by a brief identification of the most recent suicidal crisis for the patient, and also the identification of a recent period of emotional overwhelm for the partner, um, if the partner has never experienced suicidality themselves, we ask them to think about a time when they felt overwhelmed by emotions and maybe engaged in some behaviors that, that were less than helpful for them. Um, and so once these events are established, the therapist then leads the patient and their partner in each creating their own personalized crisis response plan. So the suicidal individual makes one to help them handle future suicide events, consistent with how I just described the CRP. And the partner makes one for themselves to help them handle future moments of emotional overwhelm. The original elements of the CRP are retained, including identifying warning signs, coping strategies, reasons for living or coping, social supports, emergency or professional resources. And as the patient and the partner are each working on their CRPs and the therapist is leading them through that process, the therapist is also facilitating questions to try to draw out information that one party might hold um, so, for example, are there some coping strategies you have observed, John, you, using um, that seem to have helped? Um, or, you know, was what was something that was going on that you noticed before Jane had um, her most recent crisis? And then finally, the couple participates in two brief exercises in effective communication. And I want to emphasize these are super brief. So these are not you know, uh, a whole module in, in teaching communication skills, but just kind of a nudge, just a, a little bit of an awareness um, that, that we hope that we're testing to see whether this will, will be helpful. So one is um, agreeing on some shared language for a crisis. So one thing we found in our pilot work in this area was that most couples did not identify or most individuals didn't identify with the term suicide ideation or even suicide crisis. They had their own personal words for this. So I'm hitting my breaking point. I went to my dark place. I was hitting my limit. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that partners were aware of what each other's personal words were for that thing. So you knew when someone said, I'm hitting my breaking point, when your wife said that, it meant she really needed some help or needed you to step in. It didn't just mean like, you know, she burnt the toast that morning and she was frustrated about it. Um, so identifying these terms is one piece of communication exercise that we do. And then the second is practicing using I statements to tell the other person about a warning sign, ask about emotional distress, or suggest a strategy from the CRP. So the rationale for making these adaptations, um, first, we wanted to increase knowledge. So by including partners in a suicide focus session, we hope to increase knowledge across a lot of domains. Participants could reduce just their general misconceptions about suicide, things like believing that asking about suicide increases risk, 
um, involving partners might also increase the couple specific knowledge of warning and coping strategies as I warning signs and coping strategies as I just mentioned. Um, further, given that a minority of suicidal individuals enter or stay in treatment, um, partners who are aware of specific or memorable warning signs of elevated risk, um, as well as empirically supported tools to intervene, might be especially helpful in de-escalating crisis um, in the past, in the future. So, if that if this is the one opportunity that you have to um, be in contact with this couple, um, hopefully that knowledge will be held by both of them, and that might help in the future. Um, in the opposite direction, by creating CRPs together, partners might reveal novel information about warning signs or coping skills that the other person doesn't know. So noting changes in sleep that maybe the person isn't aware of, or um, maybe accessing some coping strategies that the suicidal individual can't access or remember right now due to the mood-dependent memory deficits we know that happen during depression. Um, so yeah, you know, when you go outside, that really does seem to kind of shift things a little that information, having that in the room can be really helpful, we think, we theorize. Um, so the CCRP provides that novel source of information for the suicidal person that's not available in an individual CRP. The second rationale um, and the second goal is facilitating connection and communication. So formally including partners in the intervention might open new avenues of communication and might encourage disclosure that wouldn't occur otherwise. Um, we're hoping that it reduces shame and fear about negative reactions when you have um, kind of the disclosure occurring in a um, in a safe and mediated space with a mental health care worker right there. Um, again, uh, family members often express wanting to be more involved in care and feeling excluded. So an intervention like the CCRP, which focuses both on the needs of the suicidal individual and their partner together, could assuage some of those concerns. And at the same time, that design of a joint session speaks to some of these issues of confidentiality. So with both members in the room, the information is controlled by the suicidal individual in terms of what they disclose. Um, and also some of these concerns about time. So a single joint session is more feasible, I think, in our current healthcare system than um, multiple individual meetings, or at least as an additional tool that it would be nice to have in our, in our toolkit, um, if it does provide um, an effect. And then third, um, part a uh, third part of our goal or rationale was to bolster support for the partner or the ally. Um, so as discussed earlier, family members are likely to experience fatigue and stress and fear in the context of their partner's mental health crisis. Um, and so we want to, sorry, um, we want to help support them as well. Um, so a joint, a joint intervention for both members speaks to these needs of both the non-suicidal partner helping them um, remind themselves of ways they cope with stress, exposing them to crisis numbers that might be helpful to them. Um, and it also provides um, some support to the, uh, to, or it allows the suicidal partner to also provide some support to their significant other as well. So reducing that patient caregiver dynamic, trying to really um, normalize the fact that coping with emotional stress, coping with overwhelm, and having a plan as to how to do that safely is some, a skill that we all need. Um, so it encourages this two-way street of support where both partners can receive assistance as well as provide it. And so we hope that this may reduce some of those feelings of burdensomeness, as well as the stigma that can cycle um, conversation. So we hope that the CCRP invites both partners to be a part of the suicide prevention solution while at the same time continuing to reinforce the message that the ultimate responsibility for personal safety rests with the individual. All right. So these ideas, this rationale may sound compelling to you, maybe not, um, but the question remains is whether these things actually work. And so that's um, the RCT that we currently um, just, just finished um, follow-up assessments for. So I don't have the answers for you of, of um, what the effects were, but I can tell you uh, the study that um, we did and the um, results that will hopefully be forthcoming. Um, so we completed a randomized control trial comparing the CCRP to a couple psychoeducation session. Um, the participants were or, excuse me, 91 service members and veterans who were psychiatrically hospitalized and their partners. 
Um, the couples were randomized to either the CCRP or the control condition, and then we followed them at discharge and one, three, and six months with follow-up interviews. <clears throat> and our first aim is to compare the CCRP to the, the control condition on suicide ideation in the six months following. And then we're really curious about the effects of the frequency of CCRP the recall and use on suicide ideation and to test to see whether partner involvement increases the use of the crisis response plan um, tools. Um, service members and veterans were recruited from a private psychiatric hospital in Salt Lake City that draws patients from bases around the world, as well as from Hill Air Force Base and local guard units. They were primarily receiving treatment for PTSD and substance use. Um, and as participants come from bases all over the world for treatment there, all the follow-up assessments of both the patient and the partner were done via secure teleconferencing. So we planned for that even pre-pandemic. Um, and we conducted um, all of the intervention sessions as well via telehealth. Um, and then, so that also allowed my staff at my lab in Wes at Wesleyan um, in Connecticut to do those follow-up interviews remotely. Um, so patients were recruited first. They were screened for eligibility, so they um, needed to be either active duty or a post-9-11 veteran. They needed to be in a committed relationship of at least six months. Um, there needed to be an absence of receiving or perpetrating um, interpersonal violence in the last year. We had They needed a reasonable relationship quality score, and they needed to be fluent in English. And then after they consented, their partners were contacted, conducted a similar um, screen, and then um, completed consent, and then they were enrolled. Um, they did a baseline assessment, then were randomized, and then we followed them up um, over these many months and asked them many, many, many questions about their suicidality, their relationship, and their mood. Um, I wanted to highlight our team. These projects are never one person or even a few people. Um, so I just want to recognize on this slide here that our, our team of um, collaborators and research associates and um, study therapists. So as I mentioned, we um, just finished data collection in August with our final six month follow ups. We, you know, as I'm sure many researchers did, had our ups and downs over the pandemic, but I'm very, very grateful we were able to continue data collection for the most part um, and, and get um, this data in. Um, so we don't have results about our original question yet, but hopefully we'll have that to share very soon. But we were able to take a look at feasibility and acceptability data. So in terms of feasibility, <clears throat> we found that in fact, many patients were very interested in having their partners involved. Um, these patients were generally coming from units, as I mentioned, focused on substance use or PTSD treatment. So many were in the hospital for anywhere from two to four weeks. And there was no form of family element to their treatment. And so to some degree, they were motivated just by being able to see their partner. Um, of course, there were patients who opted out because they did not want to involve their partner or their partner didn't want to be involved. Or many, many who didn't have a relationship at all, but heard about the study and really wanted to participate with a friend or other family member. Um, so this has really sparked and expanded my interest in expanding this intervention and adapting this intervention to include any patient nominated support person, any ally, rather than the relationship partner specifically. And so we're currently working on um, on thinking through what that would look like and, and how we might um, explore that in the future. Uh, this study, as I mentioned, was designed and started pre-COVID. Um, however, we were set up from the beginning to include partners via telehealth, and that turned out to be essential. Um, so that worked out really well. We had partners participate from all across the U.S., as well as folks stationed in Germany and the Philippines and on aircraft carriers in the Pacific. And so really being able to have those folks included, even if they were at great distance from their loved ones, um, participants found really, really valuable. Um, also, for our participants who were local to Salt Lake City, they described as well, you know, mainly wanting to participate virtually because they were, you know, balancing their job and now all the care for the kids and all the additional responsibilities that came with having their partner hospitalized. Um, so uh, that was a key observation for us in terms of feasibility. Um, and finally, we stayed in close contact with the clinical teams on each unit just to see, make sure that um, kind of having this family intervention wasn't, uh, or partner intervention wasn't impacting other clinical care. Um, and what we found was that we didn't 
hear any problems from the clinical staff. And anecdotally, we've heard that the conversations that occurred during our intervention came up in group and came up in individual treatment. Um, and so that this, they viewed this as beneficial. Um, I also took a look at our acceptability data. So rather than just our observations, some of the data from the participants, um, we use some items for adapted from the credibility expectancy questionnaire here. Um, and really across the board, we see that both the patients and the partners found the CRP logical, likely to help with coping with emotional suicidal crises, crises and that they were confident in recommending it to someone else. Um, and the interesting thing I thought in this data was that both patients and partners rated the intervention as more likely to help them handle each other's crisis than their own. Um, and so this suggested there might be something unique about the CCRP that was particularly helpful in learning about how to help someone else rather than oneself, which is great to see because that's really um, kind of the value added that we see of, of doing the intervention this way. Um, and finally, in our last slide before we transition to questions, um, is there are a few more ratings, or just a few more ratings here. Um, this was a scale where one is excellent and four is poor. The first time I looked at it, I was like, oh no, um, but the direction changed. Um, so overall participants found the session was of good quality, that it met their needs. Um, though I did note for the partners, it looks like there may be more needs to be met. And so I'm curious to dig more into the data there and see what, um, what the partners, we also have some qualitative um, fields they could fill out, what else they would find helpful or were looking for. I did pull a few quotes from the patients from their open-ended feedback. Um, one person saying, I wasn't sure what to expect, so I wasn't expecting anything, but I feel the more couples discuss the topic, the more the negative stigma will fade. Another person described this as a great opportunity for anyone, but extremely grateful that things like this are being studied to help service members. And then finally, this person who, I don't know, I wish it wasn't de-identified and I could, I could put them on my payroll. I think every military couple should be required to do this upon marriage. Um, so it's so an interesting comment there. Um, and of course, this is just a first look at this intervention, but it's really was very heartening that both patients and partners um, were finding it um, um, interesting and potentially valuable. And we'll be really interested to see what the data tells us about um, follow-ups in terms of actual impact on suicide ideation and use of crisis response plan um, skills in the six months following discharge. Um, but I hope that hearing about some of this new thinking in this area has helped generate some ideas for you about how you might integrate allies into the picture as you work with your clients on um, building lives worth living and really um, doing that very, very hard work of, of trying to stay here when it's really hard. Um, and so I, you know, encourage you in this, this last moment as we transition the questions to just picture one client you're working with or a couple you're working with or family you're working with um, in your head who some of this might apply to. And just think um, if there's anything from this talk that you might want to um, take as you think through your next sessions with them or, or how you're, you're going to approach work with them um, to see if this can, can be of help to you um, going forward in the near term as we as we wait and work on um, uh, on getting the, the evidence, uh, fully uh, evidence-based data to you. All right, I'm gonna stop there. Um, I'm gonna turn my video on so I can be a floating head. And I'm gonna stop talking and I'm happy to answer questions or, or hear comments. I haven't been able to read the chat while I also talk. My, my attention is not that good, um, but I, I, I um, and welcome, I welcome questions. It, well, first, let me just say that was a fabulous presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. May, and the, the research you're doing is, exciting and can't wait to, to hear more of the findings. We do have some questions lined up, um, quite a few actually. So um, just, and this one kind of came really early on, but I just wanted you to maybe foot stomp because then we're going to go more into specifically to um, the intervention that you talked about. But like just quickly in general, why would military connected um, veterans and, uh, you know, or, or military connected clients, veteran service members, um, and especially those couples, why is there such a high risk for suicide um, was, was kind of an earlier question. Any specific yeah. put this population at higher risk? Yeah. So, well, so an interesting finding is that the, and at least my understanding of, of the, the data and our most recent data is that um, the data from DOD from active duty folks is that that we don't actually find higher 
rates of suicide death. Um, there are populations that are higher risk, like men are more represented among the military. So you you may have more clients coming to you or seeing more, more death than you would when you look at the general public. But if we adjust for um, age and sex, the rates are similar. Um, the data does suggest that for veterans, rates are higher. Um, and I think that there, I mean, we don't know. And there are a lot of possible explanations. Um, one, again, one possible or one commonly quoted or explanation has to do with access and comfort with lethal means. Um, so access and comfort with firearms, which is the leading cause of death um, by suicide in, or the leading cause of suicide, the leading means of death by suicide in, um, uh, in the United States in general and specifically and also in veteran populations. So that's one possibility. Okay, great. I'm going to put a link in the chat to some of the resources we have on our on our page too for folks if they want to dig into things. Um, yeah, there's there a lot some, there. A lot. There's a lot there. Yeah, I know. I felt bad. That was kind of yeah. a loaded question. <laughs> it's the million dollar <laughs> question, right? Yeah. Um, so, a couple of questions about uh, you know again the the intervention in particular. Um, one having to do with I'm going to pick this one first. Um, do you envision your intervention looking different if using a dyad with a friend versus a spouse or significant other? You know, obviously for, for many people, that person that would fit in that role might not be their spouse. Um, so any comments about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's definitely something that <clears throat> we um, have been thinking about a lot as we, we sort of like put together grants and are sort of thinking about, you know, next, next steps or, or our adaptation. And, you know, I, I think the biggest thing, I think for the most part, it would only help us in that it allows the patient to nominate the ally they think would be best in that role, rather than just relying on the romantic relationship as, as the reason that that person is a good support person. I think the, the reason romantic partner is particularly helpful is oftentimes if folks are living together, um, they're often, you know, in contact a lot. And that's part of what... Um, is uh, potentially valuable on the other side once they're discharged or once they're back at home or not with mental health care providers is that this is someone else who's in their milieu to lack of, for lack of another word, um, 24 seven all the time um, for many couples. Um, so I think when we're thinking about what types of allies would be good supports, if we're, we're thinking more broadly outside of romantic relationships, I think the main difference is one, just having a conversation with the patient about what might make a good person in that role. Like if they're considering different, different people to kind of have a conversation up front about it. Um, and um, also to think, and I think we just don't know, does it need to be someone who's physically close to the person who can pop in and they can go on a walk together? Or in, in our Zoom era, is it equally helpful to have, you know, your mom who lives in California, but who you talk to every day to be in that role? Um, and I think we just don't know, but, but those are questions that I think about when I think about it, extending it. Okay, great. Um, and maybe because this is, we just sort of talked about the remote relationship piece. So, you know, obviously the pandemic thrust many of us into telehealth and um, there's been so much learned and awesome lessons learned and uh, we've gotten to test out a lot of things. Some behavioral health providers are uh, anxious about providing suicide focus interventions online. So, you know, kind of given that you all got some experience on this front, um, anything about these studies that maybe inform suicide treatment via telehealth as well, or, or things that you would note your team noted? Yeah, yeah. And I would say, so one thing that was unique to, to this, to our particular study is that we did have, so the patient was inpatient at the time. So the patient and the provider were in the hospital and the partner was wherever in the world they were. Um, so for this particular design in one way for the, the most at risk patient, they were already in a, in a very safe setting. Um, for Dr. Kalifian's study, for the trust um, study, as I understand it, all of I think all of the patients were participating via telehealth. Um, uh, so I think that is a very good example of this being, you know, and she was doing, um, you know, multi-session couples therapy with folks um, with suicide as a focus. So I think that's a very good example of this being able to uh, to be done and thought through and and, and carried out well. Um, Things to keep in mind, I think, definitely are just uh, 
like with any of our clients, we never know when suicidality is going to come up. So we want to be aware of what the where they are physically located, what resources are available to them, who, who their emergency contacts are, um, have a conversation with with folks before you get to that point of what what happens um, if you're more concerned, if you need to intervene. So I think some of the same conversations we have, you know, when we're doing a consulting process with a new client in person, we're just kind of needing to add a few more bullet points, I think, about how to think through those things. That, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Um, there was a clarification, uh, do couples have an introductory session together or is the CCRP session the only conjoint meeting? The second option. So yes, there's a, it's one, <laughs> one single B, yes, one <laughs> single meeting. Um, so the first time, so in the context of the, the study, they are, you know, consented individually. Um, so we didn't want there to be any, you know, um, we wanted them both to individually decide to participate. So they have a conversation with the researcher independently. Um, but the first time that they meet with the therapist is the, is the session as well. Okay. And then do you tend to recommend couples therapy as part of a future plan? Um, was a question that was asked. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, not necessarily, not necessarily, but also, um, for it's going to depend on, on the couple. So one thing that I think is, is we think about who or what the CCRP is most helpful for. Um, it's probably most helpful for the couple who is not at the extreme end of relationship distress, right? So if, if that, they may be better suited for, for trust, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, but for couples where there's, you know, maybe there's always right, some problems or challenges, um, the CCRP might still be a very, um, very effective intervention because it's not focusing on trying to change the couple dynamic. If that appeared to be kind of the key thing going on, then a more couples focused intervention might be be warranted, whether it's a suicide focused one or, you know, something else, you know, a, a PTSD treated couples treatment, or, you know, we now have, um, we're very fortunate now to have right, a much broader um, array of couples involved. Treatment. Okay. But it's, yeah, just going to vary, I guess, like it yeah. would with the individual CRP's recommendation. Um, I, there was a, just a comment that was interesting. Um, they're, you know, kind of thinking and similar to the, does it have to be a partner question? Um, thinking about this in the context with college students. So obviously that's a, a population um, where you wouldn't necessarily have the, the same kind of diet, but it was just a comment. I can see many ways this approach would be helpful in working with college students, um, many more of which are presenting with active <clears throat> suicide ideation. I don't know if there's any work being done in, in that uh, arena, you know, not. I very much share that that person's um, thought process, though, especially working with um, you, you know, undergraduates, uh, right? Teaching yeah. undergraduates and having them work in my lab. Um, you know, it's. Uh, I think very similarly, there's a strong desire to help their friends and to be there for them, and then not knowing what that role is, and I. So I don't know of any existing work that's, you know, we have gatekeeper trainings, right? Or we have trainings right. for people who care and we have interventions for suicidal individuals, but I'm not aware of ones that um, for college students or other dyads that are bringing them together yet, but I, I would love to see them or to be involved in that work. It's a great idea. Um, thank you. Um, I'm in a, Marjorie, I'm totally going to call out and ask, can you pop that link in the chat that I asked you for? Um, cause I know you sent it to me. I, I was also just going to put some of the resources that I mentioned that we have, um, at CDP as well. Thank you, Marjorie. Marjorie is one of our awesome, uh, suicide prevention subject matter, matter experts, um, in addition to Aaron and Lisa, who are also on here. So, um, I just wanted to pause. I'm going to turn things over real quick to Mr. Norgard to go over the CEs and then we'll wrap up for today. And I welcome questions to my email. If we didn't get to your questions, amao one at Wesleyan. All right. Thank you, Dr. May. And thank you, everyone, for showing up today. And thank you again for our moderator and all of our other presenters that are here in the background helping us out. Again, we thank you. Um, here momentarily, uh, we're going to close out this webinar. And once we close out the webinar, you're going to be redirected to your My Account page. If for some reason today it doesn't redirect you to your My Account page, it's the same page that you logged in and clicked Launch Webinar to get here today. 
Uh, just right to that launch webinar button after we close out, you'll see a uh, orange, uh, orange certificate button. Click on that certificate button. The next thing that you're gonna need to complete is the seminar evaluation. Um, and then once that seminar evaluation is complete, you'll be able to uh, print out your certificate. If for some reason after the webinar, after we close out, you immediately go in and it still says that your seminar is not complete, just give us about two hours. And then after that uh, two hours, check again. After four hours, if it does not state that your seminar is complete, you can email me, but most likely that means that you did not meet the requirement uh, for time qualifications. But again, just email me. My, uh, uh, Email is there up on the screen and we'll post it in the chat here as well. And I'll turn it back over to our presenters. So and I think uh, we can keep the room open for just a couple minutes. Oh, yes, we always like to close it so the timer can start, but um, I do. I wanted to say thank you so much, uh, Dr. May, for joining us for your fabulous presentation and for the work, the very important work that you're doing uh, that impacts a population we certainly care a lot about um, and beyond. So thank you. And um, Maybe we'll convince you to chat with us on our podcast next, because I think the conversation can keep going. So I'd love that. Yeah. So thanks, everyone, for coming. We hope you join us next month to bust some myths about sleep intervention and um, have a fabulous week. And we hope to see you again soon at the next CDP Presents. Have a wonderful weekend. Long weekend. Tomorrow, I guess, is Friday. But take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. All right, everyone, we'll go ahead and close the room here and thank you again.